Hello, this is Ashley McHugh from Insurance Newsnet, and I will be the administrator for today's webinar, Women in Retirement, Outliving Security. Moderating the webinar is John Fercucci, Editor-in-Chief at Insurance Newsnet. Our panel today includes Angie Rebuffo, Founder and Financial Advisor at Ryan Financial Strategies, who is a registered representative of Lincoln Financial Securities Corporation, and Stephanie McCullough, Founder and Financial Advisor at Sophia Financial. Angie Rebuffo has made women a special focus of her firm, Ryan Financial Strategies, and has served as a mentor for many women entering the industry. She is past president of Women in Insurance and Financial Services and was their 2022 Woman of the Year. Stephanie McCullough founded Sophia Financial with the goal to empower women to make wise financial decisions and reduce their monetary stress. She is passionate about helping more women find and succeed on a financial planning career path. She is also co-host of the award-winning podcast, Take Back Retirement. Please ask any questions that you may have in the questions pane during our discussion, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Ashley, and welcome to our panelists, Angie and Stephanie. Um, as Americans are living longer, they worry more about their retirement savings. This is especially true for women who typically live longer than men and if married, outlive their husbands often. Studies have shown that women are also less confident about their finances than men. Inflation and an unpredictable market have created even more anxiety. So today we'll talk about how women and their financial advisors can address these issues. Um, before we get started, though, let's get a sense of what the breakdown is between male versus female clients uh, in the practices of our audience members. So, Ashley, would you launch our first poll? Yeah, the first poll we have is what percentage of your clients are female? None, a small percentage, about half, most of my clients, or all of my clients. It looks like the majority of our audience has about uh, half of their clients are female. Okay, that's good to know. It's always helpful to know who our audience is. Um, so um, first of all, Angie, let me say congratulations on your Women in Insurance and Financial Services 222 Women, Woman of the Year Award. Boy, that's a mouthful, but congratulations. Um, you're Thanks, the founder. John. Sure. You're the founder and financial advisor of Ryan Financial Strategies. Um, what led you to start, Ryan? Tell us a bit about your background and your practice. So I have been in financial services now for close to, uh, well, over 20 years. Uh, let's just put it that way. And, but I started on the personal financial side, you know, budgeting and those kinds of things. And in 2008, I decided that I was going to branch out and become a financial advisor. So um, there I am, 2008, going to become a financial advisor. And if you remember 2008, it, it wasn't really that great a year to become a financial advisor. But, you know, I tell people I did not necessarily have the greatest timing. But during that whole time of learning about the advising side of business, what I found is that women um, were underrepresented in the industry and underserved from a client-based perspective. And I read a study that said that even if we give women resources, if we tell them that the resources are there, um, you can follow them up years later and they still would not necessarily have acted on anything because again, the products and the services are so complex. And so I kind of made it my mission, one, to help women. I figured if I could help one woman navigate their financial journey, then I did a good thing. And two, if I could bring women into the industry, then I gave consumers more people that look like them, women consumers, more people that look like them, women that look like them, then hopefully they would come to seek financial advice. So today, Angie, what percentage of your clients are women? I would say um, single women. So I do single women by design or circumstance. So those women are probably in the 30%, but overall in my practice, it's over, over half. Over half. Okay, and I believe you said in one of our previous conversations that women's lack of confidence in finances was one of the motivating factors in how you've shaped your practice, correct? 
Absolutely. So when I look at, you know, when I have conversations with women very early on in the beginning of the conversation, they're very quiet. They're more into the listening mode and less into the talking mode. They, you know, they'll answer a question, but they really kind of don't share. And, you know, Stephanie and I have had this conversation before about that. And what I found though, is over the course of time, hopefully they will open up, they will feel more comfortable, feel more confident in at least asking the questions, not necessarily knowing an answer, but at least feeling confident, confident enough and comfortable enough to ask questions so that we can start that whole process of educating, right? Because I think education is is um, paramount to this whole process because of products and services. So yeah, it is a confidence factor. They come in, they're very timid. And by the course of conversation through the years, I've seen them blossom in effect. So yeah. That's, that's really great. Um, now, I know you've also mentored women coming into the field. Tell us a little bit about that. So this is a really tough industry um, in general. I think it is incredibly difficult for women um, to be, for women advisors, because of the way that the industry expects women to work in this, in, in, the, in the job. You know, it's more transactional, it's less relationship-based. We are more relationship-driven. And so I found that women who have mentors um, tend to do better because they have now a support mechanism in place that maybe they didn't have before, some place that they can go and work through. And so I look and say, if I can mentor women or if we as collectively as women advisors can mentor other women, then their chances of success in this industry greatly increase. And if we have more women, then we can serve more women consumers. And when we look at the population and we know that women consumers are driving a lot of money in this industry, um, we can make them more financially successful. Yeah, very good. Uh, Stephanie, you founded Sophia Financial also with the goal to empower women to make wise financial decisions, reduce their monetary stress. What prompted your decision to take that, your firm in that direction? Well, I started out really supporting our corporate benefits business. I joined my father 25 and a half years ago, and he was really, you know, an executive benefits guy, deferred compensation, 401ks, and that kind of thing. So happily for me, because I think one of the issues for women getting in the industry is they're prompted to go sell something to everybody they know, and that doesn't feel very good. So they run away. I would have run away after about 90 minutes. I would have been out. So happily, I had another path. But what I discovered, one of our biggest clients was a hospital. We did their 403B. And the majority of employees at a hospital are women. Maybe not the C-suite. You know, the doctors are getting more and more even. But below that, it's a heck of a lot of women. So I just had so many conversations with women who either outsourced the financial decisions to a man in their life who may or may not have done a good job. Or they had been, quite honestly, poorly treated by our industry, right? Sold a high-cost annuity, for example, and then the guy because mo most of the advisors are guys, right? Never answered the phone again. And I heard that story more than once, sold something they didn't understand, or they just kind of put it off. They did the head in the sand thing and they thought, oh, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. And I, in the back of my mind was thinking, there's gotta be a way to reach these people and have a more powerful money conversation that's going to help women take action and feel confident in this area. So that was in the back of my mind. And then the hospital fired us I was like, oh, I guess I have time now to work on this. So that's when I founded Sophia Financial. What percentage of your clients are women? Oh, over 90. About half wow. of them are single, either by circumstance or design. I love that phrase of Angie's. <laughs> and about half of them are partnered in some way. Yep, you also specialize in helping women of a certain age, I think is the way you put it. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, you know, we're kind of the forgotten demographic, us Gen X and baby boomer women. It's amazing. I know a woman who was the editor in chief of a magazine for women over 40, and the publisher pulled the plug a few years ago because ah, those, those women, they don't have money to spend. Come on, that's crazy. And I think, you know, when you've gotten this far in your life and either ignored it or let someone else in your life take care of it, and then if you're suddenly single, right, through divorce or widowhood, for example, and you were not the CFO of the household, then it's a really tough transition 
to go through the grieving and the trauma and the distress at the same time as trying to figure out all the money stuff. And then the other piece of it is, you know, just kind of this, this idea of retirement, which is kind of an old fashioned notion. Um, some people say, oh, I'll never retire. Some people say, I want to retire yesterday. But what does it really mean in a world where we're living longer? So I really love to dig into those juicy conversations about what do you want your life to look like? What are you trying to create? Oh, and then we line up the money to support that. Yeah. Now, you know, Angie, uh, you've made it a priority to help more women find and succeed uh, on the career path of financial planning. I think we did an article recently where uh, it was very interesting. Most of the women getting into the field initially said they did it to help people with number two being uh, to make a living, you know, so the, the helping people is a big thing, but they found training was one of the hot, really highest hurdles in the first few years. So how do you help women getting into the field? What can you do in that regard? So uh, what's interesting about us when we come into this industry, um, a lot of us are career changers. So we did not come into this at a very young age, we came in, I was a nurse, um, you know, before I became a financial advisor. But when you look at the thread of what they, you know, where they came from, most of them are coming from a helping profession of some kind. Yeah. So their initial background was a helping profession, right? So we come into financial services because we want to help people. That's what we want to do. That's inherent in our being. And all of a sudden, we now have to sell. And that's a little foreign right? To, to have to sell and have to make a production goal. And what does that mean? And we're really slow to try and uh, incorporate that into our being because it's so unnatural. And so training is geared towards selling. So first and foremost, I think, you know, I, I try to get them to understand something that's imperative. Everybody sells. Doctors sell help. Teachers sell education. Everybody sells. It's just the, the mindset. It's not the vacuum cleaner guy at the door kind of sales, right? Or, <laughs> you know, that you can't get out. So if they can do that and mentorship really helps them through that process. A lot of mine, because I'll come, a lot of my mentees will say, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be a salesman. Okay. Well, first let's flip the script, the script, right? What does that mean? And I, and my explanation is if you find a gap in someone's financial plan, that it is inherent upon us to find a solution. And that solution may require a service or a product, right? So we have to put those in place for our clients. So mentorship helps, I think, bridge that training to a place where it's more comfortable. And if we can get them to be more comfortable, then they can be more productive. And I'm saying productive from the standpoint of client relationship productive, not production. Um, and then they can be successful. And if they can make it through three years, I think everyone should have, every new advisor should have a mentor from day one, not year three when they're struggling, right? So if they can do it from day one uh, or any time in there, we will see that they will become more successful in, in this career field because it is a field of helping people. Yeah, well, those are really good insights, and we know the attrition rate is high, so I think that's that's really good advice. Uh, Steph, Stephanie, tell me about the special challenges women face in preparing for retirement. I know you said that there is really a shame and blame that women feel for not being confident in their finances. Why do you think that is? Oh, I'm telling you that the majority of women that I talk to either when they come to be a client or just out and about in the world, they have this inherent kind of idea, I'm supposed to know about this stuff. And therefore I feel shame that I don't know it. To which I push back very strongly and say, oh yeah, where, where were you gonna learn? Did you have a personal finance class in school? In my high school, we had accounting, not personal finance. Did you learn it in college or professional school? I have talked to graduates of the top MBA programs in the country that never learned a thing about personal finance. Okay, so we don't learn at school. Maybe we learn at home uh, from your family. Most families, from again, from my conversations with people, don't necessarily talk openly about money. Or if they do, maybe they talk about a couple aspects. Or they're dysfunctional around money. 
and that gets handed down as well. And then one of the major ways that women learn is through sharing their stories. But money is still the last taboo. We can talk about sex and politics and religion, but not money. Even when I talk to younger women, right, a lot of them still feel that taboo around talking about money. So if we can't share our money stories, again, that's another area that's blocked off from learning. And yet, you know, until we spread that word, I think there is a lot of shame. And so much of the barrier to moving forward is the head trash. It's the emotions. It's the, the idea that the numbers on the page are judging us. Oh my gosh, I only have that much of my 401k. That's appalling. I can't believe it. I'll deal with it next month, right? That it's just a barrier. So we need to try to encourage people to set aside that self-judgment so that they can move forward. And part of that, I think, is making a super safe space to be open. I always say you have to feel comfortable getting financially naked with your financial advisor so that you can talk about all this and the thing your way. Yeah, I think a lot of those aspects also transfer to men who haven't dealt with finances a lot. I, you know, I think that idea of feeling you should know when you don't and all of that. But there is this important side of finances, the emotional side of finances. Um, why doesn't the industry do a better job of dealing with the emotional side of personal finances? Oh, there's probably a lot of reasons, right? But I think for one, the people who maybe are attracted to finance and economics, you know, as a, as a first profession, Angie and I are both career changers, but they like the math. They like doing spreadsheets and they want to mm -hmm. dig into the numbers and that kind of thing. And maybe they went into that kind of a field because emotions and the touchy-feely stuff didn't feel as comfortable. But then also it's perpetuated by, you know, the industry and the things that we emphasize and talking about picking the hot stock or the hot mutual fund, right? No emotion based in there. And then economics, you know, the, the fundamental concept of economics, and forgive me, I never took Latin, but it's homo economics, right? Or economicus or something. Economic man, of course, man. But the human beings, this, this idea, this assumption, underlying assumption in all of economics that human beings are perfectly rational. And when they're weighing some kind of financial decision, they're coolly weighing the pros and cons, and they're going to decide what's in their best interest. Until the behavioral finance people came along, the psychologists and said, uh, human beings aren't perfectly rational in any other part of life. Why would we be perfectly rational and have no emotional attachment around money? And when you think about it, money touches all the most intimate personal parts of our lives, our feelings of self-worth and security and relationships and career, you know, and where you fit in the world, all of that touches on money. How could it not be emotional? But that message, I think, is the exception. It's not what we hear all the time. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. I never really thought about it from that perspective. Um, Angie, what are some of the challenges that women face once they're in retirement? Um, so there's a list and the list, number one, chances are many of them are going to be single, right? Because they either divorced, gray divorce is on the rise, believe it or not. Um, so that gray divorce is defined as, you know, divorces that are happening 50 years and older. So now we have women who are, who were married for the majority of their life, who now suddenly are not, they're divorced or they've been single their entire life. They wanna be single, they wanna stay there, right? So they have to um, navigate this alone. So they're doing this alone. And so they have a fear of outliving their money. They have a fear of inflation. They have you know, all of these pieces and parts. I mean, look at the last year talking about inflationary numbers. So if you thought that you were buying milk at $1.50 and now milk is $4, you know, or, oh wait, eggs are now $8 a carton, that changes your perspective of what's going on in your life. And so we have women who thought that to Stephanie's point, right? They thought, well, I'm just going to put my money in my 401k or whatever, and I'm not going to look at it. Now have to look at it because this is impacting, inflation's impacting, longevity is impacting them, right? They have an insurance need that maybe they haven't, you know, even identified or discussed because they may have been the sole breadwinner. So we don't necessarily, Necessarily talk about this early enough, I think, to in in a, in our career life to really make an impact if they don't have a conversation with someone. And so, 
these are the you know longevity risk, inflation risk, um, you know all kinds of portfolio risks that are out there that they don't understand, right? When you, I love it when I say to a client, uh, so how did you pick what's in your 401k? And they say, I didn't. Someone else just said, oh, you want to retire at 65? Well, that's going to be year 2075. So we're just going to stick you in a target fund. And they don't even know what that means. So we really have to pump up, I think, um, when we start to talk about finances much earlier and, and really break it down for them. So it sounds like there are a lot of stress factors in the mix. In the mix. How can you help women cope with the stress that they're feeling about their finances? Let's start with the conversation. I think the whole idea of what Stephanie brought up earlier about the money story, I was just talking to a colleague literally yesterday about a client that she had. And I said, well, what's her money story? And she said, well, I don't know what that means. And I explained to her, I said, her actions are based on something that happened early in her life that created this money story in her head. And if we can identify what that money story is, then we can change it. So we have to have conversations that sometimes are difficult to get to the root of what the emotional impact was way back when that's creating a behavioral aspect now. So talking to them uh, about that, because they have to acknowledge it. They have to acknowledge the fear. They have to acknowledge the concern because you can't change that which you don't acknowledge. And so that becomes, you know, primary in that conversation is let's really have a coffee talk. You know, when you get together with your girlfriends and you break it down at coffee time, let's have that kind of a conversation, not that you're the advisor and I'm the client and, and I'm going to be like this. It has to be really um, intimate to Stephanie's point about having it so that we can de-stress them to be able to then move forward in the whole concept of change. Yeah, I love that I idea. Oh, sure, go ahead. Can I jump on that one? Because yeah. what I've heard from women in interacting with other financial advisors is that they feel, they have been made to feel judged by how they're using their money, by how much of their money they're using, for what purpose. And then they feel anxious about picking up the phone to call an advisor and say, hey, I need some money from my account. And they get that clenching in their stomach. And, and that tells me like they haven't had that deep conversation about what are your values and what's most important to you. And of course, you're going to spend money on this. And it's perfectly fine to say, OK, if you're going to spend money on this, maybe we need to spend less money over here. But I think that's that's out there very much. And then the fear of working with a financial advisor, oh, because they're going to judge me for how much I do or don't have. Very interesting. I don't think most advisors are thinking about that judgment piece in, in the conversation. So that's a really good thing to spotlight. Um, Stephanie, what other challenges do women face in retirement? Well, I think we have to mention the caregiving aspect. The, the reality that most of us at some point in our lives will need care and that women are the default caregivers in our society and in a family. So I certainly know lots of people, you know, in the sandwiched, or I've heard it called the vice generation, where they are still supporting kids or caring for kids, whether they be boomerang kids or kids with special needs or, you know, in whatever capacity, maybe they had kids late. And at the same time, parents need care or Aunt Millie needs care. And usually it's the woman who gets put in that, situation spouse needs care right it happens so much so discussing that reality part of it is i heard someone say recently to care is to prepare so if you can have your stuff in order so that if someone needs to step in for you client and provide care for you it's easier because they know where your things are they know what your wishes are of course that's important but then also so tomorrow I'm, I'm leaving on a flight to go visit my parents who are in their 80s. And we're going to have the conversation again. Where's your stuff? Because they moved since last time we had the conversation. Where's your stuff? How do I find it? What are your desires, right? If things go downhill. And, and you know, I think that's a conversation many people are reluctant to have. And it's a perfect position for the advisor to bring it up and start 
thinking about, so I mentioned, you know, where's the stuff, but also what money are you going to use? Should you need care? Should, you know, you be called upon to support other family members, which might endanger your own financial security, thinking ahead of time about how much you could do that or not do that and how to have those conversations. I think that's something that we just have to work in to the service. Yeah, those are all great points. Thanks for jumping in with that. That was very, very helpful. Um, Angie, what can financial advisors do to help women in light of all these challenges? I, I when, when we look at how we as women uh, think about things, advisors, women advisors inherently uh, can make a connection, I think a lot easier with female clients because we're talking to ourselves. I mean, we can, we can go there in our head. But in general, I think advisors need to think about it from, you know, sometimes having to have that difficult conversation. It's okay to have that difficult conversation. And, and I say that because if you don't, if it's the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is never acknowledged, then you can't get beyond that. And, and, and one of the, the things, the incidences that come to mind for me is I had a, a, a spouse and her husband come in for a financial review. And the husband was very animated and very talkative and very sharing. And the wife just kind of sat there. And I said to her, I said, well, you've been very quiet in this conversation. You know, what, you know, what do you think about what we're talking about? And her response was, I have nothing of value to share. And I, I really was taken aback by that. And I said to the, to the husband, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I need to have a conversation with your wife for just a minute. And he said, sure. And I said to her, you know, you more likely than not are going to outlive your husband. And what's going to happen is you will have had no input in anything that we're doing. And now he's passed away and you're going to come in and not know anything about what was done, why it was done that way, where it is to Stephanie's point, like, you know, where is the power of attorney or where is the, you won't know any of that in a time that is already stressful. So it's really important for me as your advisor to be able to understand your perspective to make sure that we're covering that in the chance that you outlive your, your husband. And the husband said in the course of this conversation that he never realized that his wife felt that way. And so it was a difficult conversation with her, but it was an enlightening conversation and for him to see that he needed to also be supportive in that whole prospect. So I think advisors, in order to help clients, especially women clients, need, if they're sitting there and they're quiet, you need to call them out. You need to, in a gentle, kind way, say, your silence isn't helping you. I really need you to be a part of this conversation. Help me help you. You know, it's okay. To Stephanie's point, there is no judgment. And I tell clients all the time, when you come into my office, this is a no judgment zone. When I ask questions, it's to make me smarter about you, not that I'm judging what you're doing at all. So that I think that is probably the most important thing that we can start to do is make clients feel comfortable enough to partake in the conversation. Yeah, I love how you used what I'll call a little tough love there with both, you know, the husband and wife in that situation. I think that's a really good illustration of what the role of an advisor can be and, you know, having to take those steps. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, Stephanie, what are your thoughts about how to get women on track for retirement? Well, I think the first question is, what does retirement mean to you? Years ago, I, I met with a new client and we were looking at her IRA and how to invest it. And I was like, okay, well, Louise, you know that IRA stands for individual retirement account. And I reminded her of the rules when you can say like, what does retirement look like to you? And she was like, huh? What do you mean? Like she never thought about it. Someone just told her to save for this thing called retirement, but she hadn't sat down and thought, oh, I want to move to the beach. Or I want to start a new business or, you know, whatever it was, she hadn't allowed herself to look at that. So I think that's a great first step, right? If money is just a tool that's here to support our lives, what does this look like? And then I think the other part is acknowledging longevity, right? If, if 
the average life expectancy is early 80s for women. But if you've already made it to 65, it's even longer than that. And reminding people that average means 50% of us live longer, right? No one wants to kind of think about that. Everyone's like, oh, I don't want to live that long. Okay. You want to, you know, but somebody's going to live that long. Does it still make sense to cling to this old fashioned notion of 65 is the retirement age? I mean, even social security has upped it. So for me, my full retirement age is 67, but in the kind of cultural consciousness, it's still 65. Oh, 65. I hang it up and then I just play. You're just going to play for 30 years. You're like, do you really have enough assets? And most of the women I talk to don't want to just sit on a rocking chair for the rest of their lives. They want to stay active, involved, important, relevant, doing something of value. So helping them think through what does that mean? What does it look like? And oh, by the way, is there a way to earn some income while you're doing that? Because whenever we run the projections, having even a little bit of income after retirement makes the plan much more sustainable. So I think it's doing some unpacking and digging and, and maybe some pushing and nudging and, you know, gentle suggestions on, could you research maybe, maybe there's a way to work at your job just a few days a week or do some mentorship and get paid or whatever it might be that appeals to them. But I think we have to bring up the idea instead of just assuming retirement means the same thing to everyone. I think we have to dig into it. Now, what about those women we spoke about earlier who are in their 40s or older? What kind of special steps do you have to take with them? Well, it, you know, it depends on where they are, of course, um, and, and what they have saved. I have talked to women who live a very frugal life. Their focus, their whole career has been sock away the money, sock away the money. And it's very hard for them to swap to, oh, spend the money. And you kind of have to like, oh, remember the reason you saved it? It was for your future self. And now you're here. You can afford these things. And then other people, that's the completely wrong conversation because they haven't saved enough. So, you know, I think in their 40s or even 50s, I tell them if they're coming in like, this is a great time. This is the perfect time to really start to focus on this because you have time to do something about it. If you come in to see me two months after you retired, there's less we can do. There's a lot more options to look at. And I, I talk about, you know, as Angie mentioned, the different risks we face when we get to retirement, different types of assets, as we all know, address different types of risks. A giant pot of your money in your 401k doesn't address all your risks, especially if tax rates go up. Whoops. Right. So how do we think about diversifying the things that you will have in your financial foundation when you get to retirement, whatever that means? And if you can start in your 40s and 50s, it's not always about more money, you know, or having a certain number. We try to break that myth. There's not one magic number for everybody. People say, oh, do I have enough to retire? Depends. How much do you want to spend, right? Oh, and how long are you going to live? We don't know. So I think 40s is a perfect time to really dig in and start to make some changes. Great. And, 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 if, I can, and if I can jump in here, sure. John, and, and add... And just add on to what Stephanie said too, is I have I hear a lot that when I'm in retirement, I'm going to make less money. Well, when you're in retirement, chances are you're not going to make any money. I mean, you're in retirement, but do you want to live less than when you're in retirement than you do today? That's the real litmus question, right? Because if you want to live like you live today, then somehow or another, Assets are going to come out and those are taxable events. And then let's look at what that looks like in the, in the long view, right? Because now there's Medicare and Medicare premiums that all roll in. So there's a whole lot of other things that happen. So we have to de, we, we have to debunk the whole, when I'm in retirement, I'm going to need less money because that, you know, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, you could, but even if you do, it's usually not going to be half as much or three quarters less. It's it's not a, I mean, it, you know, okay. And it might be a little bit less, but not huge. And I think they don't understand. Yeah, that's a great way to frame it and to think about it. Um, I know, you know, I want to shift the focus uh, to younger women now as well. I know with my daughters, I've drummed into them 
you know, to start saving as early as possible. And my younger daughter's in grad school and she's guilty because she's not putting enough into a savings account. And I say, you're in grad school, you can't do that. But anyway, how do you focus on young women and help them really start and, you know, take advantage of time? I think that the thing is start. And, I, and again, I go back to that whole, we should be starting them much earlier. I remember my first job was babysitting and I wish my family had said to me, you know, okay, you've got $1 and of that $1, you should put X number of dollars in savings, you know, X dollar, number of dollars go here and then you can spend the rest because that sets up the mindset of what that looks like. And so if we can get young women today to look at it from that perspective, you have a dollar, where do all those dollars need to go? Because they could literally start a Roth IRA the minute that they start earning an income. Yeah. What would that look like? Oh my gosh, if you have someone who's really young starting to put money in a Roth IRA that eventually they might not be able to contribute to because they make too much. So it's to get them to start to understand that they're going to go through a career cycle at some point that's going to wax and wane when it comes to income. So when you have it, let's make it really work for you. So during those periods where you don't have it because circumstances change, it really doesn't matter because you've been front loading this money from the very beginning. So getting them to start and to understand how that will impact them later on to all the different degrees of retirement, I think it's really important because it's not just one bucket of money. As Stephanie said, it's not just that 401k or 403b. You need us there in the long run. I think that sort of uh, begs the question, how do we reach young women to educate them about this and get them started? Can I start them off in middle school? <laughs> really? <laughs> no. You know, I think if we could get into middle schools and, you know, even in some elementary schools, but the younger that we, the goal is the younger that we start with them to start to have these financial literacy con conversations, I think the better off they will be. Because then as time goes on and we start to layer more information, more complex thought processes and products and services, they will have the best foundation ever, right, to, to get that started. And although we've got Oh, Investopedia and Wikipedia and all of the pedias that are out there, it doesn't necessarily address their concern directly. It's that's that's the general population. And I'll say to them, is that you? Does that describe you? Because chances are that doesn't you know, describe you at all. So if it doesn't describe you, using that as your rule of thumb is probably not a good idea. It would be like you getting your commercial driver's license, right? Um, thinking that having a commercial driver's license is the same as just having a regular driver's license. The rules of the road are totally different for someone who's driving a semi versus someone who's driving a sedan, right? You, it's, it's an apples and an orange conversation and making sure that they understand that from a very early age, I think is important. And it also sets them up so that they're not making decisions based on fear because when things happen in the market, Fear is the first thing that come, that that rears up. They get scared. And when you get scared, you make decisions based on fear. And that, again, is not necessarily the best thing. That's why having a financial advisor becomes important because financial advisors like Stephanie and I will help them work through that fear being the logical part of their brain now. We become their logical part of their brain to help them navigate through that fear and make a good decision in a time of volatility or a time of turmoil, whether it's a economic turmoil or it's a personal thing that's happening in their lives, you know, going through a divorce or going through a death, any of those things, you've got someone who's there to help them navigate it from a different perspective. I love the idea of starting it in middle school. My wife teaches engineering to middle school kids. I don't know why on earth we wouldn't teach finance to them. You know, I think that's a terrific idea. Um, Stephanie, as an advisor, how much of a priority is it to help educate your clients? Is it a priority? Help educate them. You know, I always get a little wary about this word educate, because sometimes it comes from a perspective of, I know so much, and you, little lady, you don't know anything. So I am here to educate you. Yeah. 
So I, I'm always a little wary. That said, yes, I want my clients to be able to make informed decisions. I would say wise decisions are in alignment with your values and with your goals and educated in that you know what the trade-offs are. I, I don't know that the industry is always the best at pointing out the trade-offs of every decision, especially if that decision pays a commission to the advisor, right? Then it's the best thing since sliced bread and, oh, there's no downside. Everything has trade-offs. So I think what I try to emphasize is concepts and the questions to ask. Because in reality, are people really going to remember what the heck small cap is and, and why gold is or isn't a good idea? Here are some key questions to ask of yourself when you're facing a financial decision, of the financial professional who's making a recommendation to you, and kind of just in general of, of the world, right? Does this accord with my long and short-term goals? What's the actual cost, which is not just the price tag, right? It's the ongoing cost of owning this thing. It's maybe being tied up for a certain period of time. You know, how's my willpower right now? Am I feeling mm -hmm. tired and stressed? Am I feeling pressured by this person? Um, you know, these are some of the key questions that I encourage women to ask. I always say you don't need to know all the answers. You need to know the questions to ask and have the guts to ask them. Like, how does your advisor get paid? You should definitely be asking that and it's not rude. And if they get upset, there's plenty more of us out there. <laughs> so I think that's the focus I take on the education because sometimes it feels like <gasps> there's so much that I could learn, but there's a lot of stuff you don't really need to know. You know, there's, there's kind of a smaller subset of stuff that I think you do need to know to make a good financial decision. Yeah, very good advice. And be, yeah, go be ahead. creative about it and be creative about how you, how you explain those concepts. Um, one of the classes that I teach, for instance, when we talk about diversification, right? Because diversification is, you know, is to help you be safe in, in building your investment, right? Well, what does that mean, diversification exactly? So what I did once was I took flowers and I made flowers different things. So one flower was a bond and one flower was in stock and one flower, you know, was cash, right? And then we figured out what their risk was, like how much risk did they want to take? And we built a bouquet to look to mirror that. So now they could see what diversification looks like in something that was fun and that they probably are going to remember versus me sitting there and explaining it to them, right? This was something that they, that was fun. And I think when you can build in fun, then, you know, we remember things a lot better. We have to be creative about how we explain things because how I explain it to one client is not how I would explain it to another client. Got to I would think, where they are. And I would think that kind of a way to illustrate something takes some of the stress out of things, you know, much easier to deal with flowers as a concept as, you know, diving into the fine print of the financials. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, Stephanie, you said there are some stereotypes about women, women in their finance that may influence the way advisors interact with their female clients. What are some of those stereotypes? Oh, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> you know, I think not just the advisors, but, but a lot of women buy into this too. Like, oh, women are bad at math. Therefore, they can't do money. And when women tell me that, they'll, I'll meet someone. They say, oh, I could never do what you do. I'm bad at math. I was like, I, I have calculators and I have computers and I do the people stuff, not the math stuff. There's the stereotype that women just aren't as interested but what we're interested in is not necessarily the hot stock, but it's my own security and not ending up a bag lady. And I still hear women use that phrase, even though it's kind of disappeared from popular culture. But we have these fears and we have desires, right? We have ambitions that some of them are going to take money. So it's more to, to women. And I've seen studies about this. What money tends to mean is more what it can do for me and for my people, as opposed to just accumulating it for money's sake. There's the stereotype of women are risk averse. All women are risk averse. Well, that's BS too. It's not so much that women don't like risk. It's that we want to understand what the risk is, right? Sally Krawcheck has a good quote and talk about this too. We want to be risk aware. We want to understand, again, the trade-offs. It's not that 
you know, I have some clients who are like, they want to be all international in emerging markets. And they understand what that means. And we have a pot of cash over here. Like, they're okay with it. So it's having the conversation. Of course, don't assume we're all the same. We're, you know, over 50% of the population. We're not a niche <laughs> or niche. Um, you know, so I think th those are the three that I would highlight. All right. Thanks. So I think that's really important for people to think about that the way you approach somebody uh, can really make the difference between that communication and the conversation that you both mentioned before to re really have that be effective. Um, Angie, how does the current economy play into all this? I mean, things are very challenging right now with inflation and the rocky market and everything. So how does that impact everything? It's that fear. It's it rears its ugly head, and it paralyzes people because they don't want to either make a decision that may be quote unquote wrong. I don't want to make the wrong decision, or it's that I need to get out of whatever I'm in, and you know the safest place for me to go is cash. So in 2008, which you know, is I think the worst that I have ever seen it in, in my life, even looking back into the past, you know, 18 months, 2008 was, I think, much, much worse than that. Um, the thing that I heard then that I'm hearing less of now, which makes me feel somewhat happy, is that, you know, I'm going to go to a cash position. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sell everything now, and I'm just going to put it in a savings account because, then we have that whole longevity inflation, you know, conversation. Okay, it's sitting in a savings account making even with interest rates going up, it's not making a whole lot of money that's going to last you 35 years. And then well, then well, when when the market gets better, then then I'll come back. Okay, well, when is that exactly? I mean, because if you know that, if, if you know that you can make a whole lot of money, just knowing, <laughs> knowing that, right? Because because nobody knows that. So helping them, I think, understand those things in times like now, and the fact that really, if you're not chasing performance or looking at making the next fast buck, and really trying to look at how you can protect your assets, right, in a downside protection mode, whether, whether it's anything that goes along in your life from an insurance perspective, or, um, you know, how you uh, have a bucket strategy of cash and assets and, you know, however that is, that's geared towards your specific, you specifically, not the general pocket, specifically your goals, your timing, all of those things. If none of that is changing, then really you keep going in the direction you're going. You don't need to change anything. But if something significantly has changed, then we do need to step back and review where you are not from a fear-based perspective, but from your perspective of what's going on in your life at this time in this moment and helping them understand that, I think. And so when we look at times of economic um, turmoil, I think as advisors, if we can help our clients and our women clients in that respect, I think that we have done a really good thing because they, again, may not understand how one may or may not affect them, you know. Yeah, that's probably one of the key roles for an advisor, really, through this kind of an economy. Stephanie, what about you? How are your clients handling this rough economy? You know, I've heard it said that it's not so much the national economy that matters as, as your own economy, right? What's happening for you? And I have to say, I, I haven't had too many clients freaking out um, because, you know, either their jobs are secure or, you know, they, they've set up their safety net. I'll say one thing that it helps pandemic and now economy, you know, being bumpy and stock market being bumpy because one of the big parts of our job is to help talk through and plan for what could go wrong. And when everything's going right, sometimes it's hard for clients to get motivated to do that planning and thinking through. But when there's reminders of mortality and economic insecurity and markets going down, it's a little bit easier to nudge people along to like, okay, remember, we're going to talk about this and, and put something in place so that you'll be okay. 
So certainly there's, I've heard from estate planning attorneys, there's been an uptick in people getting their wills and powers of attorney and all that as important documents done. There's been, you know, we, we talk a lot about with people about how much cash should you have. And right? if the first question is, how should I invest this money? My question is, should it be invested? Let's look at, you know, how much cash do you have? Hey, high interest savings are actually paying high interest again. That's a good thing. So, you know, where are your buckets? What do you got going on? Um, so it's a little bit easier to lead them down those planning conversations. Very good. Um, I, we're getting near the end of the hour. I want to ask one last question, and then we'll check in with Ashley to find out if we have questions from the audience. Um, so Angie, I want to talk a little bit about long-term care. How are you working with your clients to prepare? Because we know that so many people, especially living longer, are going to need long-term care at some point. Um, so one of the things that I've done is changed my script a little bit, John. And, and so I tend to not use the term long-term care because people think of, think of it in, a, in, a, in an illness way. And it isn't necessarily an illness thing, right? Um, you know, you, you don't have to be sick, but there are some triggers that have to happen. I, I, I live in the state of Alaska. So, you know, I, I have clients who tell me that they're just going to move to the interior and we'll never see them again. And that's their <laughs> long-term care plan. Um, <laughs> not recommended. You know, I tell them not recommended at all. I have clients who say, well, you know, I think I have a lot of assets, so I, I, I'm I, good. I have an extended care plan. I can use my money. So then we have to have a conversation about double ledgering because you can't take your retirement assets that you're going to use in retirement and also use them for your, or your extended care plan because you would have already used it. So it won't be there. So we need to understand those things. And then we look at, well, what does that mean when you have an extended care plan, right? It's not just one thing. It is a plan up into itself. Do you have a health directive? Do you have a power of attorney? You know, what happens when you um, are, you know, when you're suddenly taken ill? I think the pandemic uh, brought that home, right? Because yeah. nobody expected people to, to, you know, young people to die. Um, and so suddenly that happened and, and that left families, uh, you know, um, at risk. But, you know, because this is what I looked at, looked at as an old age thing, and it isn't just an old age thing. Again, I live in Alaska. We do extreme snowboarding and extreme skiing, and you could have an accident that's going to impact two activities of daily living, right? You know, you fall off a snow machine and, you know, there you go. So I have these conversations and I try to put it in perspective from that look from that viewpoint yeah. of what that looks like. And then we can talk about, again, back to their specific circumstance and what gaps there may be and how do we fill them? Is there a product or service that they need? You know, is it that they need to go to an estate planning attorney because they need a health directive and a power of attorney and a, you know, a, you know, a will or um, a trust or that also is, a, is part of their long-term care plan, right? So yeah. it's not just, one thing, but, but it has to be, you know, discussed. And so it's a conversation I have every single year, whether they like it or not, because eventually I think, you know, I hope to get them to movement if they're, if they're, you know, giving me some objections. It's a great way to look at it. And again, we come back to really just having the conversation in a meaningful way with your clients. So I think that's terrific advice. Um, Ashley, can we check in with you and just see if there are any questions for the panel? Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions here, um, but we have one uh, comment that I would like to read first. Uh, not a question, but I wanted to say this is a great conversation. So true, so telling, so real. Thank you, Angie and Stephanie, for sharing this valuable information with us today. And happy International Women's Day to two remarkable women. I thought that was worth noting. <laughs> that is. Thank Thanks you. For, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie and Angie, for a great conversation. Um, now into the uh, audience questions. The first one we have here is, uh, do you have any advice on how to find a reliable mentor? To find a re reliable mentor. So one of the, I think, easiest things to do is look at the women who you admire, who out there um, in your, as a colleague or in your office, 
um, do you know that you admire? And then ask them, just ask them. They will be honored, trust me, they will be so honored. And if they can't because of time, um, you know, because sometimes that happens, I, I am pretty sure they will say to you, I can't do it with you right now because of X, but I know that so-and-so may be a perfect person and would, would, I would love to introduce you. So look at those women. There are other ways there, you know, uh, Women in Insurance and Financial Services has a mentorship program. I facilitate that mentorship program. You can go there. So there are formal, informal, many ways to do that. But I say start with who do you admire? Because if you admire them, that means that they probably have the same mindset that you do and the same philosophy uh, that, and perspective that you do. I would just jump in too that there are groups like Females in Finance. Um, there, I belong to Advisors Growing as a Community, AGC. Um, we're trying to get more women in there, but you know, you don't have to be mentored by a woman either, right? You can be mentored by anyone who's willing to listen and be open with you and share their own experiences and give suggestions. Um, heck, you can find a mentor, even perhaps see, someone in the industry would be great, but if that's difficult, you know, I was just at a conference at my alma mater and talked to some professors who love hearing from former students and, and you know, trying to give them suggestions along the way. You never know who knows someone. So to Angie's point about, you know, if you're asking, they might say, oh my gosh, I've got a great friend who, you know, might be a wonderful person to serve and I'm happy to introduce you. So don't just limit it to the people that you know. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, uh, do you use social media to reach new prospects and how has that worked for you? I do. Um, I have a podcast. I do post on social media. Compliance tends not to care too much because I'm not promising anybody anything. I'm not talking about, you know, returns or specific investments. I'm talking about the smooshy stuff that I happen to like. Um, and I don't, I have not been able to point to a single person who's become a client because I'm on social media. And yet I think it's more reinforcement. So if one of my clients says to her cousin, oh, you should think about trying to work with Stephanie. And then they go out and find me here and there saying things that seem interesting or having conversations that, oh, that sounds relatable to me. I connect with that as opposed to that. It's kind of, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. So if you can put your vibe out into the world in some way, in whatever way is approved for you, I think it only helps. Yeah, I, I am on social media. So I do think that social media is, is a wonderful tool. Um, I consider myself to be a Luddite. So what that what I mean by that is, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I can turn on my computer and I can get on Zoom. I'm really, I was so excited that I learned Zoom during the pandemic, let me tell you. So um, so I'm not probably as savvy as, as uh, like Stephanie in the podcast. It just blows my mind. I'm so envious of her um, to do that. But I think to her point that you, it, it gets people to know who you are and, and, and kind of what you're putting out there so that like-minded people find like-minded people. So, you know, social media is a great tool for that. Great. Uh, that's all we have for today, John. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Stephanie and Angie. Fantastic conversation. Our audience said it best. Much appreciated. And Ashley, thanks for your help as well. Of course. Uh, thank you for Absolutely. attending. Thank you. thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, you will be receiving an email with the recording. And please keep an eye out for the next webinar in this series. Uh, what will the new Congress mean for healthcare, which will be on April 11th? And happy International Women's Day. Have a great one. Women's Day.